How many Instagram followers have you got today? Six million, no? I don't know. You could look at your phone and it will tell you. I don't want to, Susie, because I don't want to lose the record. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody, I am Susie Menkes, editor of Vogue International at Condé Nast, and you are listening to my podcast, Creative Conversations. As a journalist reporting on the global fashion industry, I want to take you backstage and give you an insight into my world. Listen to my exclusive conversations with creatives, industry leaders, and those whose voices have some of the greatest impact. I think you might find it interesting and maybe intriguing. There is a lot of Olivier Roustang about as creative director of Balmain. From Instagram to TikTok, we can keep up to date on his life and times. That is for the six million digital persons following Olivier as he takes us from frying an egg to dancing lockdowns away. I remember so clearly Olivier talking about the power of social media in the fashion industry at the Condé Nast Luxury Conference in Seoul in 2016. Who could have believed back then that he would introduce Balmain, the jolie madame or pretty woman Parisian house, to a digital world connecting new generation and how they wanted to live and dress? From the Kardashians to Michelle Obama, the young designer has done it his way. Olivier was raised by adoptive parents in Bordeaux and then studied in Paris at the Esmond Fashion School. He moved first to Italy, working for five years with Roberto Cavalli, then back to Paris, where he joined Balmain at age 24, soon taking over from designer Christophe Descarnan. The story of Olivier and how his Balmain army has fought over nine years for diversity and inclusivity is unique. His supporters include Beyoncé, the Kardashian clan, Rihanna, and so many more. Then came the designer's most poignant story, a film about himself, his struggle to find his birth mother. It makes for a riveting film and a dramatic story. Olivier, welcome. So great for Condé Nast to tell your striking story. I'll tell you one thing, Olivier. Um, we all, that's six million, or it's probably by now nine million um, of us Instagrammers, saw how you've learned something really important, how to fry an egg. Is this just entertaining us that you do these things or have you really discovered something like cooking that you've never done before? I mean, it's, it's, it's in between. I'm gonna be transparent. I know how to fry, an, to fry an egg, but I know how my community love to see me and enjoy having a bit of fun with me. So. I'm just like, I'm bringing some smile in lives of people. And of course, I'm, I'm not a good cooker at all. I'm so bad at it. I'm learning every day, but I don't have the pretension to show you the best plate ever. So I'm really bad at cooking. And actually, I'm really not amazing at frying an egg. But people, for them, seeing me frying an egg is like, oh, wow. I mean, he's actually not do, just doing sketching or, uh, or being in LA with his, uh, with his celebrity friends. So. I mean, I, I'm playing a bit of a character as well because I know that they make, they make, it makes them smile and, and I love bringing some joy in, uh, in, the, uh, in the life of people. Well, I loved seeing you dancing when you danced the uh, boredom off. That was fabulous. But I never know with you, Olivier, is this part of Instagram and entertaining your view, millions of viewers, as you've just said, or is it also for real? Is it also for you? I think it's both. I, can, I cannot... I'm not faking. Actually, I love dancing. Uh, I love uh, moving. I love doing steps. So, but at the end, fashion is becoming an, a big entertainment. I mean, everybody like five years ago was like not considering fashion as a huge entertainment. But now more and more, we're going to become a huge entertainment because people need to be entertained uh, with retail point of view, with uh, fashion shows, and now with digital. So I'm not playing a role. I always love entertaining even my family. When there's a Christmas dinner, I'm the first one to 
to to to bring jokes and to to play to play with people so i mean i i'm i mean definitely like i'm i'm playing with my instagram to entertain my community but as well i want to to show that designers are not just you know we we it's a new generation of designers we the new designers now are showing more than just being uh, hidden in a, a gold tower indeed and i must say also that you are a lifetime away from the jolie madame who was the slogan of the original brand how have you led it this way you know suzy i don't think i'm so far from it i know that everybody sees me so far from from the jolie madame but um Monsieur Pierre Balmain was dressing such a diverse, uh, so so many different women from Josephine Baker to Brigitte Bardot uh, to Dalida. Uh, I would say that was as well a pop factor in uh, in Monsieur Pierre Balmain. At the same time, he was dressing Audrey Hepburn. I mean, today I'm dressing Beyoncé, Brigitte Macron, uh, Cindy Crawford, Kendall, Kim. Uh, I can dress um, Michelle Obama. So I mean. In a weird way, like I think it's just, I mean, I'm not, it's, it's not so different. After the, the aesthetic of Monsieur Balmain was a lot about couture and flamboyance, and definitely Balmain is really flamboyant. At the same time, uh, his work, he worked a lot on the tailoring, and that's what I do as well. So I think we need, it need to take time for people to see maybe in 20 years that maybe the Jolie Madame in Balmain exists still, but is, uh, and they will see it. I don't think I'm so far. Above all, because Jolie Madame is a silhouette that has been created after a war, after uh, 45. And um, and right now, I feel like we kind of go out from a crisis that is, looks like a war. So I think people will see more and more um, the um, similitude between the, the, the two visions. Um, Olivier, I think I've seen your, your growth right from the beginning. Um, I think you started, though, in Italy with Roberto Cavalli. But when I knew you, you were 24 years old and you were being asked to take over the entire brand in terms of design. Can you remember that moment and how you felt about it? Oh, yes, I think I will always remember this moment. Um... I was not as scared as I'm scared today. Because in a weird way, when you don't know what you expect, you're less scared. So I remember when they proposed me to be creative director of Barman, first, you don't know what means being creative director. You learn to be the best designer, at least, at least trying to be a designer. You don't know what means being creative director. So I was trying just to do a great collection that my clients follow, that the press likes, that the front row clap in their hands. That was the point. I mean, after you realize that being a designer is not just being a designer and making clothes, you realize that it's being, you become a creative director season after season. And this is the, the toughest world because there you build a vision more than just clothes. And there you start to see people getting away from you because they don't, you don't belong to their vision. Uh, it can be stylists, it can be magazines, they can be like, why do you do that? It's not the right vision. People question more a vision than the clothes. So there I got a bit more scared because I'm like, if they don't like my vision, it's going to be really tough. Um, but this I, I learned with time. I would say that the moment that they proposed me the job, I was not so scared. I was more scared after my second or third season when I understood that fashion is not a, a big family. It's actually uh, not a family at all. Um I know it was Christophe Descarnins who left rather abruptly. And um, at the time, um, Alain Yvelin actually said to me that he was going to give you a chance because he, like you, was an adopted child who never knew his parents and he wanted to give you the chance. Did you know that? Yeah, I knew. I knew because uh, Monsieur Yvelin has always been really supportive of my of my background as well, because he understood the strength that I had was not only for the sake of fashion, but my strengths was as well to be recognized for someone that maybe didn't have the chance to become someone at the, at the early beginning, but fought to become someone and to show a vision that was beyond the clothes and he knew it. And he always been really supportive because he was like, I, I understand you because I come from the same background than you are and I understand your the fact that you need so much to be successful because it was not only just a matter of business, it was a matter of, 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 
of brief. You know, I couldn't brief if I didn't get where I want to be. So he understood everything from the early beginning. I remember, you may say that you weren't scared, but I remember the very first show that you gave on your own. And um, you were standing there. I was there before the show looking very nervous. And um, I said something very feeble like, just do your best. But I felt as soon as you started that you were full of energy and full of ideas. Susie, this show that you're talking about was not my first. It was the military military show. And you will tell me like you're doing military every season and you're right. But <laughs> it was a khaki collection. And I, we were in Hotel de Ville when you told me, don't be nervous. And I remember because it was as well the show where Rihanna came. Uh, it was this show. And that was not my first show. It was my fourth show when I started to build the Bauman army. And there was a show where it was beyond the close. It was bringing a lot of diversity in my casting. Uh, I remember like I started to be close to Kim as well. And I remember like a lot of people from fashion was, was asking me. Um, I was really strong on social media and everybody was kind of like looking me down, like kind of like, oh, really? Like, um, who do, who do you think you are to just bring social media into fashion? Who do you think you are to do campaign with hip hop star? So there I started to become, uh, to express a vision. And that was the show where you told me, don't be nervous, be yourself. Right. I'm, I'm glad you remember my wise words. Yes, I do remember. And because this is the mom, this is the moment where I decide to be a creative director and not only a designer. And what about Kim Kardashian? What did she think of your show? She loved it. <laughs> I remember <laughs> she was, I remember Kim always been really supportive. And, and what I love about Kim is that she always made sure that she brings the biggest support and, and helping me because she's a girl that obviously fights so much to be who she is today. And, and no matter if people, what people can say about her, like now she made such a great success and, and, and she always have the right way of, uh, of, When I'm down, she always the one to tell me like, babe, don't worry, after the storm, there is always the sun. And, and she showed me that she was completely right. No matter the judgment of people, when you try, you make it, you make it happen. Well, certainly the difference to the Balmain label after your nine years is so astounding. And it's not just because of your internet, which is also astounding in a different way. But because now you've got the investment by the new company, Mehula, And that really took over Balmain and gave you the opportunity. But also, with all that, you have dressed Michelle Obama, which is pretty amazing, and also some strong, famous women like Cindy Crawford, Claudia Schiffer. So how do you feel? I mean, you're suddenly a designer to the stars. Is that how you think of yourself? No. No, no, Susie. I don't think I'm a designer of stars or celebrities or... Um, I'm a real designer. And I think my biggest fight in my life today is showing to people that I'm not creating to dress celebrities or people that I have, that I admire. This is one part of my dream, but my dream is to create cuts, craftsmanship, and being a timeless designer that bring a vision in fashion that we will never forget. This is my goal. But of course, to do that, you need witnesses of your time. And that's why I always say when I saw Kim first, like at the beginning, I was like, she's the witness of my time. She's going to be the witness of a time of a generation. And in the moment that she's going to wear my clothes, I know that because she's so important for the generation that the fact that she will dress Bauman, people will remember Bauman. And I love the association because she, she's a revolutionary. The same way that when I dressed Beyonce for Coachella, it was an, it was a moment where I knew that it will be remembered. So, um, but first, before being dressing celebrities, I'm a designer that love creating, spending hours and hours in my office. And why do I have those people embracing Barman? Is because they see the luxury of the, of the cut and of the work, of the craftsmanship. I would never get anybody wearing the, the clothes if they didn't see a talent behind that clothes. about something, Olivier, 
We've heard a lot about your French parents and how they have supported you. And whenever I speak to you, you're always saying that you want to see your parents. Now, just now, you've been separated from them by the problems that we all have. Yeah. It's pretty amazing for anybody um, to have a successful person who does fashion and is known across the world. But you are really quite exceptional with that. Is it an extraordinary thing for your parents? Not at all, Susie. I think my parents uh, uh, are not seeing the success that I have today, and I'm happy for that because they just see me as uh, Olivier from Bordeaux. They don't see me as uh, Olivier International Designer, and I think that's what I love. Like, they are still mad at me if uh, I, uh, I eat and I leave some rest on the table or I don't clean my bed. <laughs> so, and that's what I love about them. But recently, we've had the story of your life revealed in the film Wonder Boy. Um, it really is wonderfully done, this film, and produced by Yves Belmont, I think, or Primont, and directed by Anissa Bonfant. And yeah. it's all about the agony of you finding out who your natural parents were and even which African countries that they had originated from and therefore which is in your blood. Do you feel a sense now of relief that you've done this or is it something that's still quite raw in your mind? Um, it's such a great question, Susie. Um, I think every, I mean, humanity always think that when you have the truth on an answer, you feel relieved after it depends on the answer. When you open a door you might feel relieved because the answer is great. You might have another kind of question because your answer is, the answer is haunting you. Um, I discover my origins and I'm really proud because I'm half Ethiopian, half Somalian. And at 34 years old, it was important for me to know where I come from genetically. And I'm so proud of my origins. After when you discover that your mother, biological mother, was 14 years old and maybe raped, um, it's a question, it's an answer that brings you other kind of question. So do I feel relieved because I have answers? Not completely. Do I feel better with myself? Yes, because I have answers. Do I have more questions? Yes. Do I want to meet her and thank her for the education that I have today? Because the fact that she abandoned me at, at my young age means that she gave me the opportunity to be who I am today. So I want to thank her. I want to hug her. And I hope that I've not been a nightmare for her when uh, she gave birth. That's what I want to say to her. I think of that phrase, Balma Army, which you're always using. And I wonder whether that feeling is in your heart that you want to give strength to women so that they can protect themselves and that this comes from deep down from what you know about your 14-year-old mother? Uh, it's so, you know what, I think you completely understood. I never understood why I need to always be obsessed by the strength and the armure of a woman. But I think, obviously, when I discovered my origin, I maybe thought about it and I was just like, why do I need those power women that have extra powers? Is maybe because I want that they all, in a way, safe and protected. So maybe without knowing, I build that Bauman army of soldiers, of women that I want that they are more powerful than anybody and that no one can put them down. But this is something really unconscious. It's not something that was predicted. I think when I started the Bauman army, for me, it was like, the models are not only models, they are soldiers. The women that are part of my barman world are soldiers, are revolutionary women. Um, but now more and more that I grow up uh, and I, as you see, like uh, with Wonder Boy, what happened, I definitely think that it's, it's, more, in, it's more unconscious. But uh, yeah, I believe in strong women as well because I want to make sure that they can fight against anything that, that creates problems to them. But you're also, um, Olivier, very inclusive. One of the first in the Paris houses to have women of all sorts of origins. And um, I often uh, think about that expression that you use about sharing one sky together. Do you really feel that that's a motto and a mantra for you and for your women, that they, in, they could be very different and they can come from different countries and have different religions, but in a way you have something for all of them. Is that right? It's so right. I mean, we belong to one, one earth. We belong to, we have just one sky to share. We have the same oceans. We have the same seas, you know, and this is something that I always saw in my life, not only with Barman, but no matter where I, where, what I did in my life, I always 
wanted to make a huge reunion of the world. And this is something that thanks to my following, to my work, I can express beyond my clothes. You know what is the happiest thing is that today I see there's so much inclusivity and that makes me happy. But what was sad is that the time that I started that, people didn't really understand because being inclusive sometimes makes fashion system think that you are pop, popular. And so you kind of go away from the luxury that they call luxury, that's what they call chic. And I think we need to redefine those words because you can be inclusive and still being chic. Being chic doesn't mean just being exclusive. So that is, it's, it's a re, we need to rework the meanings of, of words. And, um, and today I feel like with what's going on with the COVID-19, everybody believes that we need to be inclusive because this is the reality of the new world. But six years ago, I can tell you, was not that. And you know, because you have been part of front rows and you heard different things, I'm sure. So, I mean, this is the reality. Fashion is learning. during this period of, of lockdown, you started something new. Tell us about it. Yeah, I think Barman Ensemble is, um, is, um, is a way to bring community all together. With the ensemble, we, which means together in French, we make sure that the community of Barman can see all the incredible moments from those last decade, this last decade. Um, it's about inclusivity. It's about bringing people to the Bauman world more than ever. It's something that we started to, to give people some, um, some time at home to discover the world that we are building. At the same time, Bauman Ensemble is not something that we want to stop because it's not just because of the pandemic we build at Bauman Ensemble. We want to make sure that we are more inclusive than ever. So Bama Ensemble is a project that's gonna, that started with the pandemic, but will stay now, uh, for, for a long, long term. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, a retrospective of all, all the incredible moments of Bama and, uh, and part and making people participate to those moments as well and, uh, and bringing some anecdote and behind the scenes. You're very generous in um, giving your time and your help to other people. You've just been involved with Karin Reutfeldt and Amafar and doing a, a sort of virtual um, piece this year because we can't um, go out and do it as it has been known. Tell us about that. Ah, you know, I think it's, it's, it's such important because Amfar um, and uh, CR joined together their forces to help for COVID-19. And I think whatever, whatever we can do today and help to solve that pandemic, it's the most welcome. So that's why I did that. That's why now we launched sunglasses with red uh, and network to make sure that we can help uh, with the COVID-19 as well, like Balma Ensemble is helping as well. So everything that we can do that is beyond close, that can help, it's important. I give. I did my own personal uh, donation to the Fondation des Hôpitaux. Mayula did as well. I mean, if we have a voice, it can, we can help. That's the most important. And this is something that I always believed. But even when I was, I mean, like, even the fact that I, I'm working now with Red since no, since so many years with Bono, that I was at the Global Fund with Monsieur Macron, all of that for me is so important. I mean, I know it's, it's beyond being a designer, but I just don't want to be a designer. I want to do something that is beyond beyond my fashion. And this is something that I've always been obsessed with, giving to people that have not the chance that I have today. What has this period given to you? Because a lot of us feel with these um, things we've had to face that the fashion industry is being given an opportunity to slow down. Things have been crazy busy, the way the shows have been churned out. And for me as a journalist, rushing from one country to another... Do we have to stop and take a breath now and reassess the way in which we operate? Did our fashion world go mad? Yeah, I think, I think you know, Susie, this pandemic, it's just accelerating a system that was not working. I mean, magazines, front rows that are traveling the world, seeing 50 shows a day, 
like it becomes exhausting for the people that sees it and for the people that make it without any any more passion you know and me me I'm not worried about doing so many collections because I love it I love the adrenaline of it but I can see that the people surrounding me was not as good as before so I think it's just an what's going on now is that we're going to leave a moment where yeah we're going to step back understand less collections or maybe do when when we feel we have to do it we want to do it without following a calendar without following uh between the buyers the the front row like the the magazines like maybe we will do fashion show for only buyers maybe we will do fashion shows for for um, for few of the press but it will become a different world and we need to change this because we cannot respond to um to a pressure that no one believes anyway. But you think that you can um, send Balmain forward, but in a way in which you're moving towards the future, but it doesn't have to be a new look, a new design, a new something at tremendous speed all the time, that it can be more thoughtful maybe? Yeah, I think... I think already like my sketches, the way that I sketch during this quarantine and the way that I was sketching before has changed. Because in a weird way, I feel less scared of the judgments, in a way, because I don't know what's going to be the new world. So in a weird way, I'm like, I'm less scared of the, um, of what people's going to say about us, in a way. You know, I'm more, I'm, I feel more free. Weirdly, the fact that we are in that kind of like, we cannot go out, we cannot do much, but I feel more free to think. Um, so I feel more free to sketch. I feel more free to imagine a fashion experience and a fashion performance than just fashion show, 30 models, one after the other. Uh, the car is waiting outside for many people from the front row. No, I just feel now I'm like, I breathe more and I feel like more like I want to, to express even more than just the clothes going beyond the venue. I can change the venue. I can imagine different models than just the top five models that we all need to have, you know? No, I mean, it's just so, we are living a new world. We are building this new world. So yeah, definitely I'm changing my way of sketching and I'm changing my vision of how to present my collections. Olivier, I have got one last question for you. It's the most important to thousands of people. You have to give me an answer. How many Instagram followers have you got today? Six million, no? I don't know. You could look at your phone and it will tell you. I don't want to, Susie, because I don't want to lose the record. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'm six million now. Yeah. What does that mean to you? I have half a million and um, I don't, I mean, I'm interested in what they think about me and what I do, but I can't envisage, imagine even getting up to one million and you've got to six million. Do you feel that there's some kind of mad family out there in the world who looks at Olivier Roustin? Uh There's a lot of responsibility because when you have so many people watching you, I mean, you need to be sure that what you do is right and the voice that you have and you use is, is right to help people to, to, to hope. Um, I started my Barman Instagram, my, sorry, my Olivier Instagram, like, I think it was in 2012 or 2013, maybe. And, and I remember the first picture that I posted and a lot of people were asking me, like, do you think a designer can have Instagram? And I say, do you think 10 years ago you could have sold on internet luxury? And that was my answer to a lot of people. And so today we are in 2020 and, th and honestly, Instagram is helping me to communicate and to break any isolation. So I feel really proud to have those people that follow me and, and we build a community. But I think that's what is the future. Brands are not only have clients, they build community. We are not building just a fashion vision. We are building a universe. Uh, we are not building just fashion image we are presenting a lifestyle so all of that becomes a beyond the close congratulations you've done a fantastic job on the runway and off the runway and online 
So bravo. Thank you so much, really. It's been so lovely to talk to you. It's felt very intimate for me because I am sitting in my home. Um, the uh, look of the um, behind me of this great open space is the opposite. I'm not going out anywhere. I'm in my little flat in London. And um, it's rather wonderful opening up my world with your world. And thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you for this beautiful moment. You always have a really strong, a really big place in my heart. And uh, I thank you for all what you did and all the support that you always brought, really. Well, have a wonderful time now. You too. I'm just going to save now the record because I'm so scared. <laughs> <laughs> Olivier, thank you so much for spending time with us and for sharing such special stories. Talking to you today and hearing in your words how Balma and indeed you yourself have evolved over nine years at the helm has been a real pleasure. We all love connecting with you in the digital world, seeing your vision come to life on a platform that speaks joyously to so many. Your commitment to diversity and inclusiveness in the fashion industry is an inspiration to us all. Thank you all so much for joining us for our fourth episode. I do hope you're enjoying them. During this difficult time, we are continually grateful to all the healthcare and key workers around the world and the many in our industry who work together to help protect our doctors, nurses and frontline workers in the fight against COVID-19. I'm sure you will all join me in thinking of them. And please do come back next week where I'll be joined by Marine Serre, thoughtful, filled with modernity and a true eco-warrior. Until next week, on behalf of Condé Nast, I would like to wish you all, and Olivier and the Balmain team, a safe and healthy week ahead. If you would like to find out more about our conference, please do visit cniluxury.com. To find my articles, visit the fashion channel of vogue.co.uk and at Susie Menke's Vogue on Instagram. If you have enjoyed the podcast, then please do rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, YouTube, and many others. Support for Creative Conversations podcast comes from the Condé Nast Luxury Conference. Creative Conversations with Susie Menkes is produced by Natasha Cowan and edited by Tim Thornton. Music by Jörg Zuber, graphics by Paul Wallace, and production assistance by Lauren Sweeting. <laughs>